Sanford Kelson is a lawyer and an anti-war activist and the former national president for Veterans for Peace. Uh, I'm glad to have him here today. We're going to talk about the Ken Burns series of Vietnam War, and we're also going to go into a lot of U.S. history and, and how all of U.S. history led up to something like Vietnam. So thanks, Sandy, for talking to me today. Yes, sir. Uh, so starting with Ken Burns, uh, you watched the series. What did you? What did, what was your take on on how he treated uh, the Vietnam War? Okay, uh, first let's say talk about what Ken Burns said he was going to do. He said there are multiple truths, and he said he was going to put people on that would give their uh, their truths, either interpretations, usually interpretations. And he said he wouldn't have any professors or historians on there. He just wanted these people to to uh, give their stories. And pretty much that's what he did. Now, he made the film, not me. And, of course, if I would have done it, I would have had a, a, it all together different. And here, my main problem with the film was the first uh, documentary, the first hour. And he had... Uh, Kissinger on there, for example. I have two main points. Kissinger was one, and he had Kissinger uh, say things like, uh, it's time for the nation to heal over Vietnam. Well, let's talk about healing for a minute. Kissinger is a war criminal. He killed millions of people, not only in Vietnam, Indonesia, East Timor. He was involved in uh, Chile, where tens of thousands of people were killed. So, that's like someone comes in and kills your family and uh, you catch them coming out of the house and you know what happened. And, the, and this killer says, it's time to heal. It's ridiculous. The second thing about the introduction is he said that it was uh, a war in good faith by decent people. Now, if that's believed by people, especially the people that were interviewed that thought the war was a good faith effort, that's their interpretation on that belief. But if the war is not a good faith effort, a lot of those people in that movie are just misinformed and their beliefs are inaccurate. Now, you need depth of understanding. You need to know a little bit about history. I want to hit some high points. You had European colonials come over here to this continent. And what they did was make war on the Native Americans and they took the land and committed genocide. And Native Americans today, a lot of them, are living in poverty on reservations. Uh, at the same time, they shipped the enslaved labor from Africa for free work. The colonialists, this country, got very rich very quickly based on all that free land, all, that resource, all those resources, and free labor in a way. From there, it worked so well, I think it set the mode of operation for this country and the world. They manifest destiny. They're, the white man is meant to rule. They're going to help their little brown brothers. And they got involved in a lot of different countries with that concept, always getting resources and markets. Spanish-American War in the 1890s, there were debates about this. Uh, the idea was we were going to help Cuba and Philippines gained freedom. But after the war was over with our assistance, uh, we started occupying those countries just like Spain had occupied them. And there were debates in Congress about it. And some people were, the anti-imperialists were against it, saying you're going to colonize people. We're supposed to be a democracy. You can't have a democracy and have an empire. The debate also said if we had the Philippines, we could control Asia. All those markets would have a strategic location so we could uh, get the resources, markets, cheap labor of Asia. That was what they were saying. And, of course, Vietnam is in Asia. We took Hawaii, Guam, all necessary for sea power in the Pacific. World War I came up and Woodrow Wilson said to the American people, it's a war uh, to make the world safe for democracy. It's a war to end all wars. After the war, though, in a speech in uh, Ohio, I think it was Canton, he said, is there any man here 
Is there any woman here? Nay, is there any child here who does not know the seeds of World War I was commercial and industrial rivalry? In other words, the search for profit fueled that war. With the war over, he could admit that. He had to lie at the beginning to get people to support it. After World War One, we had a famous Marine General, Smedley Butler. Wait, hang, hang on one second. Just, just to stick on World War One for a second. You want to yes, talk sir. about the uh, the Creel Commission a little bit and how that sure. helped uh, how that helped spread war propaganda? Sure. The American people, prior to World War One, elected uh, Wilson on his pledge to keep America out of that war. However, as soon as he became president, he wanted to get into that war. But the American people were pacifists. They didn't want to get into that war. So he started a propaganda campaign. A guy that chaired it was a guy named Creel. It actually used uh, advertising techniques developed by uh, Bernays, a relative of Sigmund Freud. And uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, I mean uh, Bernays, his first job, he was a psychologist, was for Lucky Strikes. They said, we want a bigger market. And he he got the bigger market by approaching women and said, you know, you shouldn't, you're not supposed to smoke. Men have the liberty to smoke, but you don't. You should smoke. You should get liberty. And Lucky Strikes, he called Liberty Stick. So he's selling a, a harmful product, cigarettes, under the concept of being liberated. And that worked so well, the Creel Commission did the same kind of things about World War I. And the American people supported World War I after that advertising campaign. Yeah, so you were, you were going to go and talk about uh, Smedley Butler. He's the... Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. After World War I, the United States was involved in wars throughout Latin America. And uh, we had uh, penetration of China. And uh, Smedley Butler was a famous Marine general who every person that goes through Marine boot camp learns of because he had two medals of honor, highly decorated Marine. When he re retired, he was the highest ranking uh, general in the Marine Corps. And he, in bitter reflection of his entire career, came out and said he was a high-class muscle man for... Wall Street, that he was a racketeer for capitalism. And he went through all the different countries where he served and explained how he made one country safe for United Fruit Company, another one for the Braun Brothers uh, banking industry, and so on. So we're still doing the same thing we did at the beginning. With war, we're trying to get resources, labor, and power. And then after that, you know, we had World War II, and I would suggest that it had nothing to do with being anti-fascist. It had to do, again, with military power, economic power, resources, things like that. After World War II, as we're getting closer to our involvement in Vietnam, uh, Eisenhower was president during a lot of this. We also invaded Iran. Uh, not We didn't invade, but we had engineered a coup d'etat against the democratically elected leader, a guy named Mossadegh. And we installed the Shah of Iran, an ex-royal uh, family member of that country, who was a cruel dictator, killed tens of thousands of his own people and tortured them. We did that for the resource of oil in conjunction with Britain. So we destroyed a democracy for profit. And then there was Guatemala, same thing a democratically elected leader. We overthrew him for United Fruit Company so they could have more land. And the time that the results of that was, were, was over, there were uh, hundreds of thousands of Guatemalans killed. So that's our history. So when we know that history and someone says it was in good faith, you got to stand that up and compare it to the history I just related in a nutshell. That's important. So now Eisenhower is president, and he was told by the CIA that if the Geneva Accords, the treaty signed by Vietnam and France after France 
unsuccessfully tried to take its colony, Vietnam, back after World War II, that if those elections in that treaty, provided for by that treaty, took place, Ho Chi Minh would win. And the problem with Ho Chi Minh for the United States was he was a communist. So much for democracy. The U.S. sabotaged those elections and set up what it called a republic in South Vietnam. South Vietnam was not two countries. It was one country that was to be unified by these elections. We called them off. And then we started sending men in with guns, right? Mm -hmm. And the history of the war in Vietnam, that was covered, I think, uh, quite adequately in that movie. And that was a major part of it, was, were battles and not the political situation that caused it. Those interpretations of people who believe it was in good faith, based on what I call a truth, I mean, there's so much evidence that the things I'm saying are true. If those interpretations are wrong, well, then that documentary had at least 50%, I don't know, 60% of people who were giving their truths that are based on a fiction. So that's what my whole issue is with the Ken Burns documentary. Right. Well, you wrote in your article, you wrote about something I found very interesting. You want to talk about Policy Planning Study 23? Yes. That confirms exactly what I've been talking about. That was by uh, a State Department official named Kennan. He drafted a policy that was uh, approved by Congress in secret. The American people never heard of it, in which... He said that the United States found itself in a very enviable position at the end of World War II. It had, I believe, and my figures will be off a little bit maybe, 3% of the world's population, but we controlled over, I think, 25% of the world's uh, economy, the wealth of the world. And he said that makes a lot of people envious that, uh, you know, we're – controlling so much of the world's economy, and of course it was through, again, military and economic power. And Kennan said, so therefore we have to forget about talking about democracy and freedom and liberty and human rights, and we have to start operating in, uh, I forget his exact words, but uh, with strong-arm tactics to keep and expand that disparity in other words, to steal more wealth from the rest of the world. But they still used, when they talked to the American people in the world, to justify all of this, the words democracy and freedom, blah, blah, blah. Again, just like the Creel Commission and the history I gave, it's just so apparent that the U.S. is trying to control the world's economy through economic and military power for the benefit of the United States. And they always justify it with platitudes that don't meet reality. So, and let me just say this, too. Yeah, yeah. People who are hearing this, and I, I know people listening to your show probably agree, I would hope, with what I'm saying. But a lot of Americans cannot accept what I am saying because, like every country, people are indoctrinated. At the very, when, as soon as we have cognitive abilities, we're being told we're exceptional. The Germans called it the master race. Same concept as the Nazis used. The master race were exceptional. To use power and economy to get whatever we wanted. So people who are indoctrinated and don't understand what I'm talking about. And it's very hard to break out of indoctrination. When I say these things, they're horrified. They can't believe it. And all I can say to them, you know, and they can vilify me or wherever they want, it doesn't take a whole lot to research this and verify what I'm saying. So those people that were being interviewed, if they have that indoctrination in them and they've never searched it to test it, to figure it out, well, yeah, that's why they're saying there's so many truths about the Vietnam War. So the first thing that you have to get into a documentary like that, which is what Burns did not want to do, is get this history sorted out and motive sorted out. How do you test the motive? 
if you call off elections, I think you're getting somewhere by the motive. If you install a, a republic in a country you have no right to be in, mm. that's a motive. Mm -hmm. So that's my main gist of what I believe about this documentary. Why don't you talk? Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the actual government of South Vietnam? Well, in a nutshell, the United States uh, actually uh, started the republic. Uh, and they quickly called off the elections under our uh, leadership. Uh, Diem was a uh, Vietnamese living in New Jersey at the time. And uh, I think he was in a monastery. He was a Catholic. And uh, we shipped him over to Vietnam, where he had uh, some backing, and installed him as a leader. And there were corrupt elections where he got like 96% of the vote. They were fraudulent. The thing to understand when you hear about a Catholic leader in a Buddhist country is that France had occupied Vietnam for a hundred years, brought Catholicism to Vietnam, and they were the colonial masters of that country. The Vietnamese people were basically slaves to help the economy of France. And what France did, uh, there were uh, Queenslings, people that uh, did not stay loyal to the Vietnamese people, but took up the French position and served the French, and they were well paid for that assistance. The United States saw fit to put uh, a French speaker, uh, a Catholic, in charge of a uh, Catholic country. Uh, he had an independent mind, though, and he was doing a lot of things the U.S. didn't like. And eventually the United States said, Kennedy said, he's got to go. And a coup was approved by President Kennedy. And he left. And then there were a series of different leaders, mostly military types, that the United States had a big hand in deciding who they would be, military leaders. And the people they refused to let into that position of power were those people who wanted to have peace negotiations with North Vietnam in the early 60s. That wouldn't do. Again, that's a big interference with a country. If you have people that uh, want to get in office to negotiate a peace, that means sharing power with communists. Uh, we won't let them have power. We were going to decide how that fake country was going to act in it, in that situation. All right. Uh, so and can I say something? I just thought of something. Yeah, of course. Uh, if you want to talk about whether or not the United States had good faith motives, okay. And what Ken Burns said is that uh, those good faith motives degenerated over the years of our involvement in Vietnam. It had something to do with uh, the president. Johnson Nixon not wanting to go down in history as the first person to lose a war. So millions of Vietnamese and tens of thousands of Americans had to die for that. So we destroyed the country. Asian Orange, third and fourth generation children are still being born, badly deformed. Uh, they look like they have arthritis of their, their arms and legs. They're all contorted and twisted. You have Cyclops, children with one eye in the middle of their head. They can't talk. They can't see themselves. They can't do anything. That's because of Agent Orange poisoning the jungle to take away the shelter of uh, can the camouflage of the trees and to poison rice. And the, the, the whole ecosystem is polluted because of it. If we had good faith and we think, oh, it was a mistake, we ought to be in there doing something about it. And basically, we're just cleaning up one military base, Da Nang, probably because we intend to use it. Uh, there were a lot of things that we could have done to do good, to correct what we call a mistake. But we didn't do those things. I think you can test whether or not the beginnings were in good faith. And if we veered from that path and we now say it was a mistake, well, let's do something about it. You want to heal. Well, healing has to be not just with Americans, but with the Vietnamese, too. If we did wrong... Let's fix it somewhat. So I, I think the good faith part of that film is what really 
angers me. I, I'm a little passionate about it. No, you should be. You should be. Uh, what about how do you? How did you feel about how he treated uh, anti-war activism and and issues like that in the series? Yeah, you know, I, I have to give him a long leash because it's his documentary. I wouldn't have taken the anti-war thing uh, as casually as he had. And, and he had one woman apologize for uh, calling soldiers uh, baby killers. And what's that mean, that one woman apologized? You know, the anti-war movement relied on soldiers and veterans. They were at the front of every demonstration or parade. The veterans went right up front. They're working with the anti-war demonstration. I don't think you can realize that from the way uh, Burns displayed it. Do you still talk to students about these issues? Yes, I talk to everybody about these issues. So tell us a little bit about what uh, what can we do to uh, try to change things. It seems like we're up against, it seems like we're back where we started, where we were before Vietnam. Maybe after Vietnam there was a little period of self-reflection, but now we're we're back in the same war. So what what what, yeah, well, anything what you can just, be done? Yeah, what you just said is true. You know, going back to Kissinger saying we have to heal. Well, we're doing the same thing that we did in Vietnam and other countries in the Middle East. You can't heal when you're still being the cr war criminal that we are. You can't do it. But with uh, students, I taught in a uh, honors course at Allegheny College it was for uh, high school students who had uh, all A's, honor roll students, special program. And I taught the lessons of the Vietnam War. I had quite a few interesting experiences there. One of my favorite, and first off, the kids loved the course. Uh, my classes filled up very, very quickly. And the children were enthusiastic. And uh, it was an enjoyable experience. And I tell them at the very beginning... I said, you know, a lot of teachers will tell you they're objective and that they don't have a position. And I said, that is not true. They're either lying to you or lying to themselves. If you study something long and hard enough to be a teacher, you've got to have a bias. We all have them. And I want you to know what my bias is. A lot of people say the war was justified. A lot of people say it was a mistake. And I call it a war crime. So I let them know my position. And I said, now you guys may have parents or relatives that served in Vietnam. And they may have a different bias than me. And I invite them to come to this class and speak to you. They will be treated as an honored guest. So this one girl told me to call her uncle that he wants to come. And I said, that's great. And I talked to him on the phone. And he... Uh, I invited him in, and he said that he had been spat on in California at the airport when he came back from Vietnam. And I said, is that right? I said, uh, was it a man or a woman who spat on you? And he got flustered, and he fumbled his words, and he finally said, I can't tell. All those hippies look alike. Yeah, now I'm testing his credibility a little bit. So I told him about the book by Jerry Lumpke, Professor uh, that wrote a book called The Spitting Image. What he did was he collected all the stories from soldiers who say they had been spat on. And he sent uh, students uh, studying either for masters or PhDs uh, to those locations. They searched, it's usually at an airport, and uh, searched for uh, incident reports at the airport. If there are private security companies, he searched their records. He searched the newspapers. He searched the tele TV records, police records, everything. And they could not find one spitting image that was reported at the time that it supposedly had occurred. And the spitting image didn't get started until after a Rambo movie when Rambo said he had been spat on. Mm. Interestingly... The Germans had the same story after World War I. They lost it, and they said they were being spat on. And Lemke theorizes, as a psychology professor, that uh, the soldiers don't want to acknowledge that they may have been beaten in a war, that they weren't macho enough to win. 
and they want to blame the loss on others. And that means, in certain circumstances, the feminine nature of our society. Because it's always the women who are doing the spitting. Hmm. And not men. And you know, men spit more than women. Women don't hardly spit. I'm not saying they don't, but it's not a common thing as uh, you would think. Hmm. So I told this guy about the book, and I sent the book to him before he came to the class, as well as our textbook. He spoke to the class. Oh, before the class started, he said, Sandy, i got to talk to you. And he said, Sandy, I have to tell you something. I was, I was wrong. I was not spat on. I heard about it over and over again, and I was upset about losing the war. And I, I really thought I had been spat on. I, I just internalized it from hearing it over and over again. When I told you I was spat on, I really believed it. Mm. He said, but it didn't happen. What a man to be able to admit that. Mm. So he gave a presentation at class, and it was kids questioned him. And when they got down, I said, I have a couple questions. I said, when you joined to go to Vietnam, when you joined the military, knowing you wanted to go to Vietnam, did you know American leaders lied about why we were going to Vietnam? He said, no, I didn't. I said, when you were over there, did you know Americans lied to justify that war and to continue that war? And he says, no, I didn't. And I said, when you came home, did you find out that you had been lied to? He says, no. I said, do you know now you've been lied to? He says, yes. And I said, when and why? He said, well, you sent me that textbook. And I read it. And I even researched further what the book said were lies of the Vietnam War. And I now believe we were lied to. So here's a man in his 60s who finally figured it out. An amazing man to be able to acknowledge that in front of... uh, other people like my students and myself and his niece. Hmm. An amazing experience. And the other thing, how do you make change? Well, I live in a very conservative area. I think Carvel, uh, advisor to Clinton, said Pennsylvania is Philadelphia in the east, Pittsburgh in the west, and Alabama in between. Hmm. Well, I live in the part that he called Alabama. And they have a county fair every year. And I applied to have a booth for Veterans for Peace. And the first year, I didn't get it. And I told them that uh, I saw the VFW or the American Legion had a booth there. And I expected to have a booth next year. And I did get that booth. And I had a sign up. And the sign said, "One, uh, two or three women in the military are raped. And that was a conclusion of a U.S. Army Medical Corps study. And I had the citation to that study under that sign. County commissioner comes and says, you got to take that sign down. I said, no, it's not coming down. And I think, since you're an elected representative, that you would be happy to have that truth known to people here. So that the children who join the military, especially the women, know of that risk. Why would you want to hide that risk, rape, from your electorate? And he said, if you don't take it down, we're going to kick you out. I said, well, if you kick me out, I'm going to sue you. And at that, there was a woman next to me selling Tupperware. She came over. And she said to this guy, and it almost brings tears to my eyes now just talking about it. She said, listen, I was in the Air Force for four years. I was gang raped. And the command poo-pooed it and didn't do very much about it. That sign is right. That sign should stay there. And the county commissioner left with his tail between his legs, and we stayed there with our sign. Hmm. So there's all kinds of things you can do like that. We had a Veterans Day parade in that time. And it was an anti-war parade. And it was a, a great thing to do in a small, very conservative, right-wing Republican town. And uh, one vet came up to me. He was crying. He had two buddies with him. And he said, uh, you don't know what they did to us over there. 
And I said, well, I am not too interested in what they did to us over there as much as I am in what they did to us before we landed men in their country with guns in their hand. What did they do to us? The answer is nothing, of course. Mm. So these are the kind of things that, you know, I do. Uh, at one parade, they had a junior ROTC from an inner city school. And there was a big sergeant, six foot something, beautiful specimen of a man in a uniform. And after these kids marched through the parade, they were at the end hanging out, waiting for something. I don't know what. They were just hanging there. And I I brought them over an illustrated copy of a book called uh, Addicted to War, explaining the things that I talked about at the beginning of this show. And the sergeant saw it and said, can I have one of them? I said, sure. I gave him one. And uh, and he called the formation. All these kids were standing there. He said, I'm going to walk by. I want these books. Mm. And I looked at the, the group, and I got in front of them, and I said, you may have had this already in school. I don't know. But if you didn't, you will. There are countries that don't trust their citizens. There are countries that burn books to keep their citizens ignorant. So they don't know what's going on. Your sergeant is burning books, collecting these books. And he said to me, there's a time and place for everything. In front of the kids, I said, that's right. And the Supreme Court said, in the streets is the time and place to exercise your First Amendment right, which I am doing. And you are a government uh, servant, and you are violating that First Amendment by interfering with my First Amendment. I don't know if these kids will remember that or not. Hmm. I found out where their buses were, and I put those books on every seat in the bus. I did this passing them out at an inner city school. I'm getting this a little redundant. But the principal came out and told me I couldn't do it to get off the sidewalk. It's private property. I said, no, no, the sidewalk is public property. She said, I'm going to call the police. I said, that's fine. He's going to come here. He's going to ask me what I'm doing, or he's going to see what I'm doing. He's going to walk away and tell you that uh, I'm not doing anything wrong. And that's what happened. And a lot of the kids that went into school didn't want the book. Some of them took it, looked at it, and threw it on the ground. Mm. And the kids are still coming in, and I said to them, your principal called the police on me. She doesn't want you reading these books. They went into school, told the kids in the school, those that didn't have books didn't take them. Or those who threw them away came out. They all wanted them. So That's how it these works. are the things you do. <laughs> uh, or, you know. Well, no, that's cool. I, I, I'm glad we got to hear both about, um, you know, a lot of the history that you've studied over the years, but then also a lot about your experiences, you know, actually talking to people and, and trying to let people know, uh, you know, mm-hmm. some of these facts. Um, is there is there anything you want to you wanna add at the end um, just to tell people? What I would like to do is thank you. Uh, because in America, so much of our conversation is sound bites, and they're all predictable sound bites. And the problem is that we talk in sound bites because we don't have the depth of understanding that's necessary to expand what we're saying or listening to. You gave me a chance. I spoke quickly because I wanted to get a lot in. You can't explain this, this stuff with sound bites. And uh, you gave me the opportunity, and I thank you. Well, I appreciate you talking. I think it's uh, it's always great to hear somebody who's had a lot of experience, you know, talk about their life and what they did. So thank you very much for talking. Okay, thank you. This is Our Hidden History, 